it's okay, I'm way better at running the um, complicated mathematical modeling than the PowerPoint, don't panic. <laughs> So tonight I'm going to talk to you really briefly about some trauma research that we're doing at the NZBRI that we're doing in conjunction with the Department of Psychological Medicine. So at some point in nearly everybody's life they will experience a horrible traumatic event, which is really sad. But for the majority of people this will be followed by a period of really short term distress and then they'll just start to feel better and they'll move on with their lives and they'll be able to function as normal. Unfortunately for some other people, this short-term period of significant distress continues for quite some time and it may follow them throughout their lifetime. Accompanied with this long-term stress, there can also be other horrible, significant physiological and psychological outcomes. So what we're particularly interested in is the brain changes that accompany this period of stress and particularly the long-term implications of experiencing a stressful event. We're really interested in what happens to people after they've experienced trauma, but if they haven't gone on to develop any other major psychological problems. Our argument is that you can experience trauma, have no anxiety, no depression, no post-traumatic stress disorder, no feelings of hypervigilance, no feelings of inadequacy, no feelings of anxiety, and that your brain might still be experiencing some changes. So, if you're experiencing short-term distress, sometimes this can result in this long-term list here of terrible things. I'd particularly like to highlight the difficulty thinking and the hypervigilance. These are not necessary, necessarily something that will be picked up clinically by your GP or by even any of your friends, but it may be something that causes you some day-to-day -day discomfort. Obviously, the most significant and severe outcome of a traumatic event is post-traumatic stress disorder which is a horrible disorder where you're constantly plagued by flashbacks and anxiety and the inability to cope with daily living. So I just want to really briefly talk about the neurocircuitry that's involved in trauma. So there's three main areas of the brain that we're interested in. The first, the red area, is the orbifrontal or medial prefrontal cortex, basically the front of the brain. And what happens is, in a traumatic event, your amygdala, which is within that green area in the brain, that will respond and that will basically go crazy. Something bad happens and that part of your brain is lighting up all over the place. And it's the job of the red area, the prefrontal cortex, to calm the amygdala down. Unfortunately, what happens with trauma is that sometimes the prefrontal cortex won't do its job. So the amygdala is getting really stressed and being really active and the prefrontal cortex isn't calming it down. Then what happens is these connections are strengthened and strengthened and so every time there's another traumatic event, the prefrontal cortex again fails to calm down the amygdala and unfortunately the hippocampus, which is also buried in the green part there, remembers all of this. And so you think, okay, my brain's doing weird things, all right. But I'd like to talk to you about what this might mean daily. So I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this. If there's an earthquake, your amygdala then fires and that's when you start feeling really stressed and anxious and you might start sweating and you might be in a state of absolute fear, basically the fight or flight response. You need to do something about this. Your prefrontal cortex is supposed to come in and go, okay amygdala, it's all right, let's think about this logically. Let's just get under a table or something. And then your hippocampus remembers, okay, there's an earthquake, I feel really scared about that but that's okay, I can react and get myself out of here and get myself safe. Great, your neurocircuitry is working, congratulations. What happens, however, in someone who's experienced trauma, not necessarily with post-traumatic stress disorder, they've just experienced trauma, what happens to most of you when a big large truck comes past? <laughs> I'll tell you what happens. Your amygdala goes, oh my God, that's an earthquake. And your prefrontal cortex goes, yep, pretty sure that's an earthquake. We should freak out. Let's, let's get out of here. Let's duck. And then your hippocampus remembers, oh, yep, truck, earthquake. Okay. And this whole time, your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex and your hippocampus are conspiring against you, and those connections are all strengthening each and every time a truck comes past. So basically, you're all stressed. Sorry. 
So what we want to do is, okay, I'm getting to the point of why we're stressed out the entire city. What we want to do is we want to look at normal, healthy Christchurch people that were here during the earthquakes. It's now obviously 10 years on. If any long-term outcomes have manifested, we should be seeing them. And indeed, there is obviously a higher incidence of stress and anxiety and unfortunately also post-traumatic stress disorder amongst the Canterbury residents. What we're interested in, though, is not those people. Those people are under the appropriate clear of clinicians and people that aren't me. I'm interested in the people that are fine. They present to their GP and their GP says, you're fine. They present to psych services and they say, mm, you're okay, you're not scoring high enough on the stress scale, you're okay. So what I want to do is actually determine whether you are okay neurologically. So we were very lucky at the New Zealand Brain Research Institute that when I returned from the UK, a um, huge study running out of the Department of Psychological Medicine had basically just completed an eight-year follow-up on people that were psychologically healthy at the time of the earthquake, but had obviously experienced the earthquake. And we got funding to pop all those people in an MRI machine and see what was happening in their brains. Now, to investigate the um, threat response, so the fight or flight response, we unfortunately have to show people a lot of images. I hope you were all paying attention to Tracy's lecture. This is the one where the brain's all lighting up in lots of different places. It's functional neuroimaging. So we show people a whole lot of these really horrible pictures interleaved with really nice pictures. And what we're interested in is what the brain is doing when they see the nasty pictures. Because our argument is that if you're in a state of hypervigilance or in a state of fear, your brain's going to respond to those nasty pictures in a different way than it does to the nice ones. So, this is my last slide. What we're looking at here is basically the results of that functional neuroimaging study. We've popped everyone in the scanner, we've showed them all these pictures. The blue is our Christchurch people, and this is what's happening in their brain when they see the not very nice pictures compared to the nice ones. Now, the thing is, with this task, every single person, no matter where they are, their brain will light up like this in response to the nasty pictures. That's just because your brains are designed to not really like that stuff very much, which is fair enough. So because we need to test whether this is actually a problem or not, we also scanned a whole lot of people in Dunedin. And we said, sorry guys, you've got to go through this because of Christchurch. Sorry about that. <laughs> so they all sat down and did the same thing in the MRI machine, and the red is the areas in Christchurch that are different to the areas in Dunedin. So the Dunedin people also see the nasty pictures and their brain doesn't really like that very much either. But the red regions, and I'd like to point out they're in that prefrontal cortex region, are the bits that are different in Christchurch. So this is very, very preliminary. We got these results on Monday night. So at this point, we're concluding that something is happening in Christchurch. We don't know how significant it is. It might be nothing. It might be just due to any number of other things that we haven't yet controlled for. But there is enough preliminary evidence to suggest that possibly there is some neurological implications for people that have experienced the Christchurch earthquakes. Um, it's possible from animal research that those prefrontal regions are involved in resilience and might go some way to explaining why some people kind of come out of this stuff okay and why some people don't. But again, it's very early work at the moment. So. Thanks. Mm. Thank you.